Hey everybody, this is Maxine Taylor with another edition of Move Into the Magic with my dear friend, Roberta Grimes. And those of you who have followed my show uh, know that Roberta is one of my favorite guests because uh, the information she has to share is so profound, so wonderful, and she does it with such humor and such fun. Um, as we know, because one of her books is called The Fun of Dying, and the <laughs> other is called The Fun of Staying in Touch. And I think my favorite book is Liberating Jesus. Um, although her latest book, The Fun of Growing Forever, is the one that we recorded la a couple of weeks ago. But I have invited Roberta back because today, uh, we are going to be talking about something absolutely marvelous. Uh, you know, some of you know that Roberta has uh, spent decades studying uh, hundreds of years of communications from the dead. She is um, an attorney. She graduated. Uh, she got her law degree at Boston University. And what uh, started as two experiences of light when she was just a child have blossomed into this incredible connection she has with the other side. So today our topic is what Jesus really meant. And so I am going to stop talking and invite my darling friend Roberta Grimes to take over. Hey girl, welcome back. I'm so glad to be here, Maxine. Thank you. And of course, at this point in my life, this has to be my favorite topic, too. I just think it's so important that we say, wait a minute, it's been 2,000 years. We've been doing it our way. Why don't we go back and see what Jesus intended? And to do that, a little bit of background. I should first say, when I was at Smith, I majored in early Christian history. I then, when I was early, actually in my teens, I started reading the Bible cover to cover. I urge every Christian, if you're a Christian, sit down and read the whole book. It makes a big difference in how you see it. I've read it six to eight times cover to cover, and the New Testament twice as many times. Parts of it I can recite now for, by heart. I, didn't, I stopped it in my mid-50s when I realized a few things that are important. I had learned from my study of the afterlife that nothing Christians believe is true. And I was the most devout Christian you can imagine. There is no anthropomorphic God with a beard who judges us. There's no judgment by anybody but ourselves ever. Um, there's no fiery hell. There's no condemnation by anybody to hell, except there is what Jesus called an outer darkness, except we put ourselves there. Nobody else does. There, there's no, nothing, and most importantly, I think, for Christians, certainly for me, was the fact that since God doesn't judge us, since God is only pure love, which Jesus told us, and since God is loving spirit, as Jesus told us, there was no need for Jesus to die for anyone's sins, and that was not what he was doing when he died on the cross. Yes, he died. Yes, he rose. Those are important facts, and I think we can pretty much document them now. But we got all wrong what he was doing. And if that's possible, don't believe me unless you follow what I'm suggesting you do and prove it to yourself. But if what I'm saying is even possible, don't we? Doesn't he deserve a second look from us? After all, whatever you believe he did, I can prove to you now Jesus is real. The dead tell us he's real. And he knew things about God, reality, death, the afterlife, and the meaning of our lives that we could not have confirmed until we had these communications from the dead. Jesus is a big deal. He's a much bigger deal in the afterlife levels than he is when he, you know, among humans. Uh, the most devout Christian does not a tenth understand the importance of Jesus compared to what the dead, the dead understand. He's the greatest figure in all of the afterlife levels by far. With all of that said, let's look at what he said, which I think is very important. Now, the first thing I want you to understand, the first thing I want you to understand is that the things that Jesus says in the Gospels were said at a time when everybody around him was an Iron Age primitive. These were people who had... Uh, no understanding of any of the stuff we know. 
And he had to, here, this eternal being who was literally God on earth had to speak in very simple terms, the way you talk to your five-year-old. He had to talk that way to adults then. And that was his first handicap. His second handicap was that he was talking at a time when to, in, in his neighborhood, to speak against the prevailing religion immediately got brought you death. Now, we know he ended up being killed because of his teachings, but it took him three and a half years to get there because he was very cagey about what he said. So as we read him now, we can't say, oh, that's inerrant. Whatever the way he put it then, we have to like parse those words. Instead, let's step back a bit. Let's look at the fact that first, the Bi and this is a little digression, but I think it's important. People who, who say the Bible is inerrant do not even believe it themselves. If the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God, no mistakes in it, then everybody who styles their hair, cuts it, everybody who shaves, uh, everybody who does not stone their, their, their daughter to death before their house door because she was not a virgin at marriage, every one of those people is a hypocrite. You don't believe those things, but they're right in the Old Testament, everyone. Please understand, the Old Testament is full of horrible stuff that no loving God ever could have said. But that's okay, because what Jesus did, first off, was very important. He said, someone said to him one day, uh, what is the, um, oh, first they said, well, did you come to abolish the law and the prophets, which is what they call the Old Testament. And he said, no, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Okay, what does he mean by that, though? Different day, different temple guards, because they were watching him every time he spoke. But the guards kept changing, even though the followers didn't. So he had to say things over days of time and hope the followers would put them together. Different day, someone said, what's the greatest commandment? And he used that beautifully. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then he said something very important. He said, in that consists the whole law and the prophets, all of it. So you take the whole law and the prophets, what we call the Old Testament, if we're Christian, and we put it aside and we say, okay, we've replaced it now. Jesus replaced it 2,000 years ago with two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. That's all you have to do. But it's big. And what it does is to put responsibility onto us for our actions. We can't pick and choose in the Old Testament anymore, which is what Christians invariably do. They'll, they'll hang you if you're, a, if you're a, a homosexual, but they themselves go to the barbershop whenever they feel like doing it. That's hypocritical. That's got to stop. If you don't believe it's all inerrant, then you've got to say none of it's, none of it's the word of God till we can demonstrate it is. So what does that mean? First of all, it means the whole of the Old Testament, I've found no evidence that any of it is, is true. It's beautiful. <clears throat> Parts of it are really beautiful, but it's not the inspired word of God. The second thing it means is that we've got to see whether we can validate anything about, <clears throat> can I do a timeout for this? Sure, take your time. <clears throat> I've been talking all morning. <clears throat> we've, we've got to see whether there's any way we can validate at least the teachings of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It turns out there is a way. Because all those afterlife communications from the dead that I have been studying tell us Jesus was right about so many things. This is very big. We can demonstrate not only is Jesus real, but not, and not only did a lot of the events of his life happen, but he told us those things about God, reality, death, the afterlife, and the meaning and purpose of our lives. We could not possibly, not possibly have validated in any way until we had what they said. So that's really big. What about the rest of the New Testament, which is mostly letters from the Apostle Paul to the early church? Not so much. What Paul did as a first century man was the only thing he could have done, and I think we should be very grateful to him for it. What he did was to package the teachings of Jesus in first century Jewish theology. 
Mm-hmm. That's where we got the idea of the sacrifice. They were sacrificing animals in their temple. And that's where we got the, the idea of God as judge. All the things that we sort of believe. Now, a lot of the New Testament is beautiful beyond the Gospels. I get it. It is. But it's also not the inspired eternal word of God. We've got four books in that, in that Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And not even in those books, because we know that the early church <clears throat> edited the Gospels. They took out some things that Jesus had said. They even said they had primarily stuff about reincarnation, which they decided they didn't want to believe in. But they also added things. And it's easy to spot what they added because invariably it's about church building. It's about instilling fear. Now, here's the problem. In reality, Everything is consciousness. There is nothing else. And consciousness has a range of vibratory rates. The lowest is fear and the highest is love. Remember Jesus' first commandment. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. If you fear God, you cannot love him. That's like trying to sing at the lowest and the highest note simultaneously with one voice. You can't do it. So as long as you fear God at all, you cannot obey Jesus you got a choice, and that choice to me is pretty simple. I had to stop attending church, and I was such a Christian. I still love the religion to this day, but I couldn't go to church anymore because it was scary. I mean, hearing people talk about, you know, God's judgment and and above the altar, above the very altar is a life-size, full-color, plastered Jesus bleeding on a cross. I couldn't be there. Mm-hmm. But that's okay because I don't miss it because I've got Jesus. And Jesus in the Gospels is quite enough. What we've come to understand is that his teachings actually are the easiest prescription for spiritual growth ever given us. It is incredible. I understand now why it works because we know so much more than they did back then, but it works beautifully. All you have to do is follow his, his teachings. And that's what he said, I'm here as a teacher. Nobody listened. Jesus said, if you follow my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that's in John. I don't remember the exact quotation. Follow my teachings. You're my disciples if you follow my teachings. But there is no denomination among the 40,000 odd different Christian denominations on earth today. There's not one of them that says, we're going to put aside the 2,000-year-old beliefs now. It's time. And we're just going to follow Jesus closely, closely. And that's what the Christian church is going to have to do. And it's going to have to do it for a simple reason. At the upper levels of what we think of as the afterlife, it's really real life. There are very advanced beings, some names you know, who are working on easy ways to communicate with the earth. They know they've got to get in here and straighten us out. And all they really have to do is prove that they exist. And that's what this is designed to do. It'll be probably within two or three years. They tell us, of course, time is different there, so we aren't sure about the timing. There'll be an easy way for people to talk to their dead relatives without a medium and say, yeah, we go to church on Sunday. Is all that stuff right? And Aunt Martha's going to say, don't you believe it? You just follow Jesus. And that's when enough people hear from Aunt Martha, there'll be empty churches like you never saw. Unless, unless, and this is what I hope and pray for, unless Christianity church by church will say, okay, we were supposed to be following Jesus all along. Now we really can understand what he said. We're going to start from today teaching. And, you know, the Great Commission was go spread my teachings. We're going to follow the Great Commission 2,000 years later. We're going to go spread his teachings over all the earth. His promise is that when you do that, you'll bring the kingdom of God on earth. I believe his promise. And I understand now why it, why it works, because of the way consciousness works. Now, there are people who out there are going to be saying, um, well, what about the fact that uh, uh, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Well, I don't think that's what he said. Remember, he's talking to first century primitives yes. who don't really understand what he's talking about. And those words went 60 or 70 years before they really were written down. So a couple generations anyway of people you know, playing telephone, children's game of telephone with his words. And so they probably put some shorthands in there. And to them, what he really said, which I'm sure was, 
My teachings, this is true, my teachings are the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father but through my teachings. Right out, that's true, Jesus. But it was handy for them. I am the way, the truth, and the light. They thought they were the same thing back then. They're not. Never again tell somebody that they've got to accept Jesus as their personal Savior. They don't need a Savior because God already loves us infinitely. If your best beloved child needs a Savior from you, then yeah, we got a problem. But no, you love your children an infinite amount of the amount that God loves each of us. Each of us. Don't put that whole horrible 2,000-year-old first century Jewish dogma into the minds and hearts of people. Instead, say, go to God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. In that consists everything else. Jesus also, by the way, I think anybody reading, this used to bother me when I was a kid, everybody actually reading the Gospels can see he really didn't like religions. He, not at all. He said, beware of these teachers of the law. They, they're such, they think they're big shots. And he says, uh, don't be like the hypocrites when you pray. Go into your inner room and pray in secret. And the God who sees in secret will reward you. He told us that the kingdom of God is within us. It, it, that's true. Yes. Your mind is part of the eternal mind of God. There's no separation between you and God. For there to be a, a religion or any kind of belief system between you and God is artificial. It's put there by man. The only way to really relate to God, and I had to learn this the hard way after many, many decades of trying everything else, the only way is to open your mind and heart and say, here I am. Use me. My life is yours. It feels like, I, I call it living with an open prayer line. It feels as if the top of your head is open and everything you think is being beamed to God and God's beam is coming back. And when you really trust God enough to live that way, miracles happen in your life and you get used in ways that you could never think of on your own. It's the way to relate to God and Jesus gave it to us 2,000 years ago. You don't need a church. In fact, the churches get in the way, and I hate to say this. They come between you and God, and they teach you to fear God, which is the opposite of what Jesus wants us to do. So, you know, people are thinking, well, how could we be a follower of Jesus and not a Christian? Well, I'm actually saying I think the evidence is pretty strong that Christianity has not worked. Uh, it's gotten... There, there isn't, I don't see anything that it has really changed in human culture. And the, just the very fact that it's so fragmented tells you that it's not, there's, there's something not right about it. But we now know that Jesus' teachings are true and they work and they will bring the kingdom of God on earth. So I would say, in my case anyway, I couldn't be a Christian and be a follower of Jesus. I, in the end, had to make a choice. Do I choose God? And Jesus, or do I choose this religion that I love? I had to choose Jesus. I had to choose following God's messenger on earth, which is what Jesus is. And I don't look back. I mean, it gives Jesus is much more than enough. So to people who are saying, well, uh, Jesus, see, I'll can I tell you, Chris, Matt, Maxine, this is the problem. Yes. Christianity is too easy. It's they, they, every religion works the same way. They instill in us a great fear, usually a fear of God or a fear of the unknown or something. And then they say, but we got this handy little solution here. If you, if you warm the pews and you put money in the till, we'll, yeah. keep, we'll, we'll, we'll let you have our solution. And in the case of Christianity, it's Jesus died for your sins. Just claim him as your savior and you go right to the, ed, the head of heaven's line. Not only is there no no evidence that that's right, but what it does is divert people from the reason we're here. Jesus tells us the reason we're here, and so do the dead. We're here to learn to love and to forgive. Radically, not just occasionally. Jesus says, Peter said to him, well, how many times do I have to forgive when someone's the same jerk sins against me? He didn't use the word jerk, but it's, he would have. If, it, if, the, if the word had been in use then, he would have said that. Do I have to forgive him seven times? And Jesus said, no, I tell you not seven times, 70 times seven, or depending on the translation, 77 times. No matter how many, forgiveness has to be 
actually provenient. It has to come even before the harm, because if you've already forgiven, then nothing ever bothers you. You basically never are harmed again. I wrote about a lot of this in The Fun of Growing Forever, which basically details how the teachings work and why they work. And uh, it's blessed with a wonderful forward from Jack Canfield, who, who um, I just love. He's a wonderful man. But he's trying to do the same thing in the world. He's trying to reach each person with the, with the message that will sing in that person's heart in order to transform everybody on earth into love, forgiveness, peace, and this unity of all human minds and hearts, which is meant to be. We are meant to be one. There really is only one of us because we're all part of God. Our minds are part of the eternal mind of God. So everybody who's working for that is doing a wonderful thing. Everybody who is saying, I don't care how many followers he has, if he's saying, you're going to do it this way or you're going to go to hell. And if he's, you know, or, uh, you know, if, if, accept Jesus as your personal savior. And um, if, if you don't do that, then um, you, you're not going to be with your family ever again. You're going to blink out like whatever they say. Scientists have the same problem. They are determined to teach people that you blink out like a light. There's so much evidence that's not true now that uh, anybody who tells you that we blink out like a light is telling you that he has not studied any of the evidence. And it's time now for us all to grow up. It's been 2,000 years since we were given the truth. Yes. There is no other area of our lives, including especially science, where we take what they said 2,000 years ago and say, okay, must be true. They said it then. It's time for us to say, okay, we're going to look at what actually happened 2,000 years ago. We're going to look at what it actually means. And I have spent my life, well, the past 20 years of my life, since I figured out I was on the wrong track, I've spent my, my, that, all that time trying to understand what we are supposed to do. Say it again. I have spent all that time trying to understand what we have, we're supposed to do. And what we're supposed to do is to follow the teachings of Jesus, bring the kingdom of God on earth, and love. Oh, and there's one more thing I want to make sure we mention. Yes. The book of Revelation, that gets thrown at me. Well, Jesus said in the book, he, Jesus did not speak in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation was just a fad back then. When, when the Christians were being persecuted a couple, three generations after Jesus, there was heavy persecution and they were so desperate to be rescued by, by God that they, uh, and, or by Jesus, that they, there was a whole series of these writings that circulated about Jesus was going to come and save us. And the, the people in the Council of Nicaea in 325, the wise heads took the worst of these, the very worst, and they made it a book of the Bible. But it makes no sense. Not only is it not factual, because we know that uh, if there were a war to uh, get rid of evil on earth, it would create monstrous evil because it's very, very low vibration energy. It would create fear, anger, hatred, strife. So the, the real way that God could mess up creation would, to, would be to send Jesus to, quote, save us. But they couldn't have understood that then. We, we can understand it now, though. But also, Jesus had just come from earth. With it, you know, less than 100 years earlier, before, you know, before that book, uh, the book of Revelation was written, Jesus had been here, and he had been telling us how to bring the kingdom of God on earth. He gave us the instructions, and then he let us do it. And then we were off to kind of a poor start. I mean, we were getting persecuted, but he had some hope, I'm sure, at that time, that we were going to follow the teachings, which is why he came. And, you know, there was hope. And then, 70 years or so after the death of Jesus, he decided instead to just chuck it all and bring chaos to the earth. That's what, the, that's what people who believe in the book of Revelation actually believe. It yeah. is nonsense. There will be no second coming because Jesus never left. Those teachings have been in our Bibles for 2,000 years. The problem is that this is, this is the greatest gift God has ever given us. And it had to be wrapped because of when it came in first century theology. And we have loved that theology. We've played, it's like getting the, under the tree the best present. And, and it's all wrapped, and we love the wrapping. You've seen toddlers do this. We, they play with the wrapping. They don't even think. It doesn't matter if there's a present inside. We've spent 2,000 years playing with the wrapping. 
Yes. Now it's time for us to open the gift and understand it was never about the wrapping. It was always about the gift, which is those precious, perfect teachings, which if, an, if 10 or 15% of us follow them, we will bring the kingdom of God on earth. We have Jesus' promise, and I think I can prove to you why it will happen. So that's what I have to say about what Jesus brought us. <laughs> wow. And you know, Roberta, I, I, in my practice, my astrology practice, my healing practice, I have seen that so many people understand what you are saying, what you are sharing, what Jesus came to share. Nice Jewish boy yep. came to share. And nice Jewish here, boy, he we, still is. <laughs> still is. And I'm seeing a change. I'm seeing a polarization in our world uh, between those who want war and fear and 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 keep promoting it for um, financial gain, basically, um, and and stir up hatred in their politics, um, yeah. and those who want and live love and know that we are one. And I see that that particular group growing so that we're approaching a tipping point where I really do believe we will be able to live the way we, we from love. Maybe not a new generation, maybe yeah. not in my lifetime, but it's, it's happening because of this polarization. There's got to be a pop. We understand that for more than 100 years, the very highest level dead have been working to raise the consciousness of this planet. And all of this is part of the process. Um, all the work that's being done by so many people to spread the truth, to help to get rid of the old fears and anxieties and lies, frankly, old beliefs, and to spread the truth. And um, that's what you are doing. I'm that's trying my best. That's my commission. And your and books so are absolutely awesome. Let me give everybody your contact information. <clears throat> if you would like to get in touch with Roberta Grimes, her website is robertagrimes.com. And again, Roberta, thank you. Come back anytime. <laughs> and everybody out there, be blessed, be loved. Know that you are loved. And join me again next time when I once again have another marvelous guest like Roberta Grimes. Uh, till then, remember that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Yep. Till next time. <laughs>